All right, well, welcome everybody. We're talking about Philippians 3 today, and I want to thank our scripture reader today, and I hope you're enjoying the, the youth style service. Uh, I've been pretty excited about this one. So what we're going to be doing today is we're going to be talking about a very uh, interesting group of passages, but I, I wanted to call this message the greatest life now, which can come across as kind of like a health, wealth kind of a message, but it's not that way. We're going to be talking about ultimate ideas and the greatest possible life. We're going to be talking about the greatest threats, these, these huge ultimate ideas uh, that we often talk about, but we're really diving deep today. So let's start by recognizing the greatest threat. Paul starts his passage here by, by talking about things that ultimately move us away from God and that any system that moves us away from Christ is of an ultimate danger. It's a huge threat. Paul starts in verse 1, he says, I don't mind repeating myself because I know that this is important. In verse 2, he, he gets really intense. He, he talks about his enemies, the, the Judaizers, who are moving people away from Christ and moving them towards destruction, and he basically says, they're liars, they're dogs, they're my enemies. And for him, he talks this way because he knows that it's serious. Paul exists in a world where he, um, he witnesses persecution all the time at the hands of the Romans, and he also talks about the roaring lion uh, walking around seeking who he may devour. He knows that there are really intense enemies to the faith, but he's not so much concerned with physical death. He knows where his friends are going if they believe in Jesus. He's concerned with people that are moving, uh, that are moving believers away from Jesus and into a legalistic pursuit, back into a Judean uh, value system where you have to do certain things in order to belong. And that's just never been uh, Paul's mandate. See, Paul, Paul. He, he doesn't get angry about much, but what he does get angry about are these types of people. The people who say, yeah, Jesus is good, but you need Jesus plus something else. Jesus isn't enough. You also need to do these things. And, uh, and I resonate with Paul. See, there's a few things that frustrate me in the world. I never, ever get frustrated with non-Christians who they don't have the Holy Spirit. I don't expect them to act like Christians who do have the Holy Spirit. But I do get frustrated with Christians who are trying to add to the faith with legalism. They say, yeah, Jesus is great, but you need Jesus plus long hair or Jesus plus no dancing. Jesus plus circumcision, which was the exact problem Paul was dealing with. And when you encounter these kinds of people who are trying to add to the faith, it's a very slippery slope. Because essentially what you're saying is, I need you to jump through these hoops before you can be a part of the club. Uh, a friend of mine, a, a pastor who many of you would know, would usually say, you catch the fish before you clean the fish. And as a, as a fisherman, I know that to be true. You don't ask people to act a certain way before they have the Holy Spirit working in their life. And it's a very uh, intense problem for Paul because he knows it's moving people from Jesus just like it is today. The next point would be make the greatest exchange. This great exchange um, of, switching from, of switching from this old way of thinking, a legalistic idea where I have to do good things to get God's love, moving to a place where you say, um, I, I'm moving away from that to a place where I know God is working in my life and I know that he is with me, loving me, protecting me, and we have a relationship um, where, where we talk and we enjoy each other. And that's what Paul's trying to move people to. He's trying to make this great exchange, the greatest exchange, and what I, what I said about this was it's time to cut the scubula and trade earthly things for ultimate things. We'll talk about scubula here in a second. So Paul here, he's talking about verses 5 to 11. Uh, and that's, this, that's what we're focusing on right now is verses 5 to 11. And here Paul gives kind of his resume, which is one of the only times that Paul actually kind of brags upon himself. And he does it for a reason. He starts to say, listen, I had all of the necessary credentials you could ever have. A Pharisee amongst Pharisees, according to the law, blameless. Like Paul, Paul was, he studied under Gamaliel. He was, he was the ultimate Jew. He, he could not have been set up any better. Basically, in terms of Christianity, he's, he's Franklin Graham, you know, the, the best case scenario. Everybody knows who you are. You're, you're very well set up. And he says, but you know what? Now those, those credentials don't matter to me anymore. Those things are not important. And see, 
likewise, another thing that frustrates me is Christians who try to incorporate that way of thinking. They look back at their past and they actually enjoy the, the, old, the old way of life that they used to live and they reflect fondly upon it. In fact, they, they want to incorporate it into their, their new life with Christ. They want to bring in their old sinful self and then often they, they want to move back to that system of legalism. And the reason is because it's easy. It's super easy to be legalistic. Because with that mindset, you just say, if I follow the rules, then I get to go to heaven. It's a very basic model, but it's a, it's a way to work yourself into heaven. And everybody would just prefer, at least I would prefer, um, here's the rules, as long as you do them, you're good. But that's not what life with Jesus is like. It's a relationship with ups and downs and hard times in life and good times in life. And it's not just about rule following. It's about relationship building. So that's what Paul brings himself to. He says it's not about more money, more money, more degrees, more degrees, uh, more, more hierarchy, more, more climbing the ladder. He says it's not about that. He says, in fact, when I followed that old way of life, to me, it was scubala. So let's talk about scubala. Now, I'm not going to lie, I was really excited to have to say this out loud, but scubala is a word that Paul uses, and there's two times very particularly where Paul talks about his old life. The first time, um, he says, it's just like uh, old rags is the way that it's usually translated in English, but that's not what Paul is referring to. Paul's not beating around the bush. He, basically, when he says it's like old rags, what it, what it actually would have meant was menstrual cloth. Paul's not... Paul's not uh, He's not massaging the words to make it sound nice and pretty. That's the way he thinks about his sin. And here he calls it scubala. Now, scubala would have been essentially the derogatory term for dung, okay? So I don't need to say it out loud, but you can. Um, if you want to really get the imagery of what Paul's saying, all of that old stuff, all of my old resume, all of the climbing the hierarchy, I consider it all to be scubala, my my, my desperate life pursuit of climbing the social ladder was a miss. I, I failed. I, I, I failed to climb the ladder, and it was let down after let down. And now when I look back with my new life in Christ, with my new following of my Savior, I know that that old life was not the way that it was supposed to be. Um, I've thought about this a lot. And uh, whether it be the old life and, and how you... you you, uh, you bring glory to that old life and that old way of thinking. You know, I, I know a lot of people that think of the way that, you know, they used to be in college and, and how fun it was to party and sleep around. And they're Christians, and yet they still look at it and they think, ah, you know, that was really fun. And, and, you know, me being one of those people. And I can look back and I can say, no, 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 that was a waste. It was scubala. It was a terrible thing to do. And I wish I had come to God sooner. And I think that's the way Paul's thinking. Likewise, many people, they, they know God, and they know that life is temporary, and they know that, um, they know that death is around the corner, and that heaven is, heaven is there. They believe deeply in God, and yet the push of consumerism, the push of the world's standards, the push of the social hierarchy, and the you need things, and you need more, and you need more money, that push... Uh, seeps into their life, and I feel that too. I feel the push to get more money, the push to get more things, the push to get more accomplishments, more likes, more value, more money. And Paul is saying, no, it's all scubala. We need to trade earthly things for ultimate things, and everything else is a loss. I read a story um, a few months ago, and it's my favorite story, uh, to preach on. If I could ever preach anywhere else, I'd probably find a way to bring it in. And even though I did it a couple months ago, I'd like to read it again because I've read it so many times and I know other people will, will, will get the uh, value out of it as well. There's an analogy that comes from the world of games. It was used quite some time ago by this psychologist named James Dobson. So the person who's writing this is John Ortberg. I, John Ortberg, first learned it from my grandmother. My grandmother taught me how to play the game Monopoly. Now my grandmother was a wonderful person. She raised six children. She was a widow by the time I knew her well. She lived in our house for many, many years. And she was a lovely woman, but she was the most ruthless Monopoly player I have ever known in my life. Imagine what would happen if Donald Trump had married Le Leona Helmsley and they, have had, and they had a child. Then you have some picture of what my grandmother was like when she played Monopoly. 
She understood the name of the game was to acquire. When we would play when I was a little kid and I got my money from the bank, I would always want to save it. I wanted to hang on to it because it was just so much fun to have money. Her, on the other hand, she spent it on everything she landed on, and then when she bought it, she would mortgage it just as much as she could and buy everything else that she landed on. She would accumulate everything she could, and eventually she became the master of the board. And every time I landed, I would have to pay her money, and eventually every time she would take my last dollar, and I would quit in utter defeat. And then she would always say the same thing to me. She'd look at me and she'd say, one day you'll learn to play the game. I hated it when she said that to me, but one summer, I played Monopoly with a neighborhood kid, a friend of mine, almost every day, all day long. We'd play Monopoly for hours. And that summer I learned to play the game. I came to understand that the only way to win was to make a total commitment to acquisition. I came to understand that money and possessions, that was the way you kept score. And by the end of the summer, I was more ruthless than my grandmother, and I was ready to bend the rules if I had to, to win that game. And I sat down with her to play that fall. Slowly, cunningly, I exposed my grandmother's vulnerability. Relentlessly, exonerably, I drove her off the board. The game does strange things to you. I can still remember. It happened at Marvin Gardens. I looked at my grandmother. She taught me how to play the game. She was an old lady by now. She was a widow. She had raised my mom. She loved my mom. She loved me. And I took everything she had. I destroyed her financially and psychologically. I watched her give her last dollar and quit in utter defeat, and it was the greatest moment of my life. And then she had one more thing to teach me. Then she said, and now it all goes back in the box. All the houses and the hotels, all the railroads and the utility companies, all the property and all that wonderful money, now it all goes back in the box. But I didn't want it to go back in the box. I wanted to leave the board out, bronze it maybe, as a memorial to my ability to play the game. No, she said, none of it was really yours. You got all heated up about it for a while, but it, and it was around for a long time before you sat down at the board, and it will be here long after you're gone. Players come and players go, but it all goes back in the box. And the game always ends. For every player, the game ends. Every day you pick up a newspaper, you can turn to a page that describes people for whom this week the game ended. Skilled businessmen, an aging grandmother, um, someone with a brain tumor, teenage kids, and they think that the whole world is in front of them, and then somebody drives through a stop sign. It all goes back in the box. Houses and cars, titles and clothes, filled barns, bulging portfolios, even your body, it all goes back in the box. And Paul knows it. And so he says to us, trade earthly things for heavenly things. Make the great exchange. Then he moves to the final verses of the passage that we're focusing on today, and he talks about pursuing the greatest maturity. Point number three, pursue the greatest maturity. Forgetting the past and staying faithful to Jesus. See, once you're at the point where you're willing to say, I want to do this, I want to trade earthly things for heavenly things, I want to focus my life on Jesus, to store up riches in heaven, Paul says, okay, well, there's two kinds of races that you can run. The first is this earthly race, buying things, accumulating things, storing up wealth, becoming prestigious, having other people look at you and think that you're great. Classic. And the second is heavenly. The greatest maturity is spiritual maturity, where you grasp love, hope, joy, and you care for other people, where you take your time on earth to carry a weight that helps humanity at large, where you say, my job on earth is to make to make life better for everyone else because that is what life with Jesus is all about. It's about bringing the garden um, back to earth. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Doing the things that Jesus would want us to do. Restoring the kingdom of God. See, I find it very hard uh, to ignore pleasure. You know, I want a new truck. I want nice things. I want to have stuff. But God reminds me that when I put my focus away from those earthly things and I move it to heavenly things, it's always better. See, Paul, is, he, he says, yeah, there's two different kinds of races, but he also gives you a little bit of input into how to run the race. Verse 12, he says, I don't mean to say that I have already achieved these things or that I've already reached perfection, but I press on to possess that perfection for which Christ Jesus first possessed me. No, dear brothers and sisters, I have not achieved it, but I focus on this one thing, 
to forget the past and to look forward to what lies ahead. I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God, through Christ Jesus, is calling me. Paul says, it's not about the past. You have to keep your eyes focused on Jesus. You know, a couple weeks ago, there was a, a young woman who, uh, who called me, and somehow she got my name, and she lived uh, not in the area. And she called me, and she said she was all distraught and anxious about the future and about all the things going on in her life. And I reminded her of Jesus' uh, words, that today has enough trouble of its own. You're, you're, you don't need to spend your time worrying about tomorrow. And I gave her this... Um, I gave her this uh, challenge. I said, you know, most people that I come across, they're either concerned only with the past and the future. The two things they spend their time focusing on, the regrets of the things they used to do, and the stress of tomorrow and the challenges to come. And I said, actually, with Christianity, it's not about thinking about the past and the future. It's about thinking today, what can I do today, and then thinking about heaven. God didn't ask us to think about our past, and he didn't ask us to worry about our future. He said, today has enough troubles of its own. Concern yourself with today and what you can do today. And then think about forever. Think about eternity and keep that in mind. Um, I found it fairly ironic lately. I've been watching some TED Talks. And when they have these TED Talks, they fill the room uh, just with successful business men and women, doctors, lawyers, everybody. And they all come to basically get input into how to make my life better. How do I avoid heart heart failure? How do I avoid sickness? How do I avoid mental illness? How do I live a better, more fulfilling life? And get this, if there was ever, ever not just a here's the race that's better to run, but, but truth that God has programmed into us, a little inner GPS when we are Christians into how to run the race, this is it. So I watched a TED talk and they, and they said, listen, If you want to avoid mental illness and heart trouble and and all these challenges, the best way to do it is to help others. Every day, find a way that you can help someone else. Give them a hug. Not right now. Give them them a word of encouragement. Go volunteer somewhere. And I watched this video and I thought, goodness gracious, it took this psychologist, this scientist, all these years of study to come up with that. The, uh, The way to relieve mental illness and struggles is to help others. Yeah, like as if, as if God didn't put that in people's hearts. Similarly, I was watching uh, Coronavirus Explained, which if you're looking for some good information, the Netflix special uh, Coronavirus Explained was pretty good. Anyway, and it was talking about mental illness. And, and we know that all through the world right now, there's people that are really struggling. I am sure of it. And to all these people who are really struggling, um, Netflix, of all things, said, here are our two suggestions for how you deal with mental illness. The two things that, of all the things Netflix could have concluded to help people in the middle of um, anxiety and depression, uh, in the middle of coronavirus, in the middle of this global pandemic, who are stuck in isolation, who have people all around them who are sick and who have family dying, said, here's the two ways to deal with mental illness. One, Sing in community. Can you imagine? Sing in community. And two, volunteer. That was the two things, their two suggestions. And I thought to myself, I laughed out loud when they said it. See, God doesn't just say, this is the race that's better to run. He says, I'm going to help program you, the desires, and, and I know the better way to run the race. I know the way to run the race. It's not by accumulating and sticking in and not caring about anyone else. Your life is best when you give it away, when you love other people. Well, let me just end my my sermon today by giving you one more thing I'm frustrated about. Uh, I guess the last thing I would say is that it's frustrating to me that I can't really help you more run your race. I, I love being married, and I love being a brother, and I love being a friend. But yet, at the end of the day, I'm running my own race. I don't walk hand in hand to heaven with Emily. Um or or any of my friends or any of my family. It's my race to run. And I know deep down, even though I'm a pastor here, that I can't run your race. I can't help you with it, and that frustrates me. I wish I could preach sermons every week and know that people were becoming Christian left, right, and center and turning their lives away and saying, I'm, I'm getting rid of these things that I don't need, and I'm, I'm selling my, my fifth car so I can help the poor, or, and, I'm, and I'm taking steps toward Jesus and trading earthly things for ultimate things. But I know it's your own race, and you're doing it on your own, and that is kind of frustrating to me. And yet, I guess what I would say to you is, um, faith is a marathon. It's not a sprint. It, it's, it's about learning on your own, 
Paul puts it this way. He, he says at the end of this passage, verses 15 and 16, he says, let all who are spiritually mature agree on these things. If you disagree on some point, I believe God will make it plain to you. So he's saying, like, if, you, if you're struggling and you're having these arguments, God will work it out through you. But we must hold on to the progress that we've already made. When you feel down and you feel out and you feel like you haven't made any progress, my trick is to look back at where, where I've come from, how far I've come, how much I've learned. See, it is a marathon. It's not a sprint to the finish line. Some days are good and some days are bad. But it's about waking up every day and giving your life to Christ again. To wake up and say, you know, it all goes back in the box. And to understand that and to feel that and to know that and to press on towards the goal. Your job is not to compare yourself to other people who are doing better. There will always be someone who's doing better. Your job is to compare yourself to who you were yesterday. And then again the next day. And then again the next day. To keep ultimate things in mind to take up the struggle of the day and do what you can today and keep eternity in mind and to press on towards the goal. Um, and that's my prayer for you. Dear God, um, we understand that the pressure of the world is strong, that the pressure of the media and consumerism and uh, the standards of the world, they push in on all sides, that we know that uh, wealth is fun that accumulating things is fun. To get more, it's fun. And yet, Lord, we know that uh, the things of heaven are not of this world, and they are so much better. That someday we will look upon you and, and, know, that, uh, and know that it was all worth it, the times that we gave ourselves away to others, the times that we chose the uncomfortable path, um, the times we got ourselves up and out of bed to go to church and to volunteer, to help our neighbors. Uh, God, help us keep eternity in mind. And Lord, help us to understand what our job is today and to do everything that we can to help those around us and to carry that weight. And Lord, be with us as we do it, for we know that it's only in your power that we can do these things. Um, not our will, but your will be done. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.